Justice for Better and Worth. The podcast where we don't believe you have to sacrifice your relationship while you build your net worth. We are your hosts. I'm Chris. And I'm Erica Young. And we're so glad you joined us today. All right, y'all. Come on. Let's get into it. Hey guys, we're back again, episode four of the For Better and Worth podcast. We're your hosts, I'm Chris Young. And this is Erica. And so we're just, you know, this thing is really rolling now. And so we're <laughs> we're in episode four. So we hope you've enjoyed those first few episodes and we're really trying to, you know, continue to put out good content for you. And so this time we're going to kind of share our story. We're going to talk about how, you know, we got out of debt you know, and uh, there's there's some things to be said about it. Yeah, I think everybody has a story on one, how they got into debt, and two, if they are on the journey out of debt or if they have gotten out, there is a story behind it all. And so we're going to share ours so that you can see honestly how far we've come and really the motivation behind most of what we do in our life. And this is sort of that background story. This is that foundation. So um, come along. We're ready for that journey. I think the funny part about it is when you, when we start talking about how do we get in debt, I think sometimes people look back and be like, well, man, how did this happen? Like you really can't tell the story because it just creeps up on you if you allow it to. It's certainly easy to, fall into debt and not realize you're there until you're drowning or overcome or overwhelmed or sinking. And you begin to have that feeling where you're like, wait a minute, this cannot get any worse. We are not about to go any further. So I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's something to reflect on for a lot of people is how did we end up here? Because if you don't figure out how you got there, it's super easy to end up there again. And we just do not want to repeat our past mistakes. Yeah, I think about, you know, debt and, you know, you got to go back to your childhood and your family and, you know, some of those things. But I'm going to just fast forward and think about me. You know, when I got into college, because going into college, you know, let's be honest, who had that? I didn't. You know, as a 17, 18 year old high schooler, I didn't have any of that. It really wasn't until I got to college. And, you know, I was I was a good student, but let's be honest, I didn't apply myself (laughs) as well as I should have. So I didn't get a lot of scholarships. You know, I got some uh, I got some grants and some things like that. But I was introduced into this fabulous product. And it's called student loan debt. All right. I hope y'all hear the sarcasm in all of that. There is nothing fabulous about student loan debt. Okay. Exactly. It fabulously misleads you (laughs) because they were like, yeah, you can come to school. And I was determined to go to college. You know, I didn't have anybody to pay for it. And so I was like, okay, well, if this is something I have to do, I took some debt, but I actually worked, you know, all four years well, four and a half years while I was in college, I worked almost full time for the last two and a half years. But I remember I got my my student loan and, you know, you go to the bursar's office and you sign off on it. And they don't tell you that the refund is, oh, yeah, you got to pay this back. I was a starving college kid. I was like, oh, I got some money left over. Oh, yeah, let me let me have that. I'm going to buy some food. I'm going to buy some new sneakers. I'm going to do some stuff that clearly if I knew then what I know now, I would have said, you know what, keep that portion of it because I don't want to be obligated to pay that back. Right. I think it's super easy for people to not pay attention to the details of how much school costs and how much loans are taken out, how much you're signing for on the dotted line. And no one looks at that differential except to say, oh, I can go get a pizza now, like you said, or go shopping we don't see that as something we have to pay back or something that will draw interest later. And I think this is a really good thing to share with students, your kids, anyone who is looking to go to higher education and they're trying to figure out how much it's going to cost. Make certain that you are very realistic and also taking into account the what I call 
credit or debt slip or that creep into too much, that territory that we don't want to belong in? Yeah. So I, I, I know I got a few student loans for college. Then when in college, like every student, I got a credit card or two. And so I started living off those and paying the minimums. And, you know, then when I was, you know, I transferred schools and I really started working full time. And so I had to get a car. And I remember I got a, bought an 87 Honda Accord. And I remember I thought I was like, man, I had a little small, you know, car loan. And, you know, I was paying that. But then I reached a point where I, you know, I was making a little bit more money, even though I was going to school full time. And I had to buy a nicer car. And that's the car that when we got married, I actually had that car. Mm -hmm. And I had a car note for mm -hmm. that car. So here it is. I've got a car note. I've got student loans. And I've got credit cards. So by the time, you know, we met and we decided to get married, I definitely was bringing my fair share of debt into the relationship. So yeah. when you talk about getting into debt, that's really how me as a young man, how I incurred debt. And that's how I you know, made my voyage <laughs> into the, the debt world. So what, what about you, Erica? My story is very similar. Honestly, I graduated from high school. I had a little bit of, you know, scholarships that very first year. And honestly, those scholarships fizzled out in years two, three, four. And yes, I was in school five years. Um, and so I did take on student loans. I did take the T-shirt and the free pizza in order to get a couple of credit cards. And I'm pretty sure I had about three or four of them, to be honest, by the time I graduated. And I, too, got a car note while in college. And those are the things that led us to graduate and you know, honestly have that deer in the headlights, like, how did we end up here? This is crazy. In the span of four years or five, in my case, of college, we accumulated quite a bit of debt between us. And I even was a resident advisor in school. Chris was a resident advisor for a year. Like, I was a resident advisor for two years and then a resident director. And I, so I got a stipend on top of not having to pay room and board. But college is expensive. And that is how we found ourselves in over sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars in debt when we got married at the young ages of twenty-two and twenty-three. And it's easy for people to do that now and exceed that amount of debt when they graduate. It pains me when I see people who are teachers, for instance, with a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. It's not uncommon. And it is why I've been doing what I do and why we have been so committed to not only getting out of debt, but remaining out of debt and making sure that our kids can do the same thing. Just imagine if we hadn't been resident advisors and if we had incurred that as additional debt for room and board and if we hadn't received those stipends then we would have had to get that money from somewhere. Yep. And so we were smart in that regard to know, OK, let's try and mitigate this or at least minimize it. But even in. And that we still started out as a young couple, you know, not making a ton of money, but, you know, $65,000 in, in debt as a young couple. I'm like, man, that's a that's a pretty big load to bear. So when you think about it, what that what that debt feel like after we got married, after we put it all in one big, you know, messy pot and we <laughs> saw what that looked like. Uh, it wasn't one of those good stools that you make that you smell when you walk in the house. It was like, ooh, this thing stinks. This right. terrible. I was thinking the exact same thing, the debt stew that we put together, because we consolidated our student loan debt, and we had these, you know, car payments, and it was a lot. The number is so much bigger when you get married and you add it all up together, right? Like, it almost seems manageable when it's just one person. And then when you add another person and you realize this household has this much debt, it gets a little scary. And, and that's the honest truth. It was scary. It felt overwhelming. Our monthly payments were over a thousand dollars. I think it was closer to $1,200 a month. Um, when it was all said and done, I, it, that's a lot. It's a lot of money. And, you know, God saw fit to, bless us with a baby in year two of our marriage. And that was a lot. Year 1.2. Yes. <laughs> and so, I mean, honestly, when you think about all of the obligations and responsibilities that we had at that age, 
it was overwhelming. And I think that's where our commitment to getting free of those payments, um, getting out from under that mountain of debt was so important because we, we had a child now. And I think, you know, she motivated her presence, motivated us to do something different. Yeah, and that's not even taking into account that once we had the baby, we started incurring, like, child care expense. And, you know, we were living in, a, in an apartment. And then we were like, well, we got a kid. Now we got we to gotta get a house. So we went out and we built a house and, you know, got a mortgage. So it was like, man, as a husband, I started feeling like, well, geez, man, this is a lot that, you know, we're taking on. And so when I think about, uh, you know, how it made me feel – it just made me think like, wow, I have a lot more responsibility now. Mm-hmm. And so I had to really get serious and it was time out for games. It was like time to get serious and start to figure out how we could do something different. So what was your first step? Like you're the one who kind of got us on this journey. What turned on you in your mind or what happened that made you say it's time? You know, I just look back, you know, and – think about growing up and think about how my mom and I love my mom you know she's not with us but she taught me so much and I saw how she made sure we had everything that we needed now we didn't have everything that we wanted you know we didn't have everything that we needed most sometimes but she really made a concerted effort to try and really provide for us and so I saw her hustle and I saw my brother you know some of the things he was doing and my sister and I was like you know growing up in the city I just wanted something different And we had already moved, and we had both, you know, graduated from college. So we were, you know, amongst the first in our families, you know, to graduate. And so I was like, you know, I just want something different. And then when I started to see what the debt looked like after we put, you know, student loans and credit cards and the car notes and the mortgage and put all that in one pool, and then we started talking about, child care and you know we got to (laughs) eat so we had to buy food and we were never gonna miss a meal (laughs) right and then you know in Arizona you know it was so hot well we had to have air conditioning and I just started looking at all of that and I was like man I've got to do something different to help maneuver my family and take us in a direction that was going to set us up you know in the long term and so that's really what started to motivate me to begin to think and act a little differently. And so, you know, sometimes people can't even see past having the debt. And so could you, could you see a future without the debt? That's a good question because I think a lot of people believe that you'll always have a car payment. You'll always have the need for a credit card and the student loans will follow you around like a pet. Like I think there is this notion that you may never get free. But I saw glimmers of hope. I really did see a light at the end of the tunnel. I honestly wasn't certain about what that would really look like. But I had hope. And I think that that glimmer of hope is what kept me going. And I couldn't see the eventual 20-year future or even 10-year future for that matter. But I think I could imagine the possibility of no payments. And if I can imagine the possibility of no payments, then I can imagine the path to get there and take steps one, two, and three, even though I don't know what steps eight, nine, and 10 look like. And so that's that. Yes, I could see something. I didn't know what that thing was. You went you went back in the day to Jesse Jackson, like, keep hope alive. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I had a little hope. I just, you know, I, I don't think I saw the full picture. And I think it's okay to know that there is something brighter and not be able to clearly define it. So um, I think that, yeah, there was something there. And I think over time, I was just patient with myself and with that journey to to get there. Um, But, I mean, did you see a future without, say, credit cards or a car payment? Like, is that something that you could see? You know, I had, I don't think I had actually thought about it. Honest, if I'm being honest with myself, I never thought about it. Because we went from, I went from working and going to school to having a family. Yeah. (laughs) And so I don't even think I had time to, 
to think about that. I just went into, you know, parental survival mode, more or less. Like, okay, well, here we are. So I've got to do something. And you know me, I've never been one to sit on my hands and just, you know, be content with where we were. I always am looking for ways to, you know, improve myself, improve our situation, and improve our position. And so for me, it was one of those things like, okay, well, here we are. Problem solver. Let's uh let's start looking for solutions. Yep. And you know, the 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 thing for for me, I think that that served us well, that helped us is that you know, I had a long commute, you know, to work when we lived in in Phoenix. And I used to listen to the radio. I used to find just find ways to burn time up on the commute. And on that commute, you know, I would channel surf and, you know, I, I channel surf one day and I came across, you know, Dave Ramsey. And I was like, well, who is this guy? What was he talking about? <laughs> and so I started listening and, you know, he had some principles I was like, okay, this is this is some good stuff, you know. This this could work, and I mean, I didn't agree with everything, but I was like, well, this is a good place to start. There's some good things that I think I can do, and so I came home and I I think you remember I was like, hey, you gotta listen to this because uh, there's something here that can probably help us. Yeah. And so uh, you know, just that's kind of where I started to make the shift. Mm. I was already feeling like I had to do something to take charge, and I know men. All the men out there, you know, stand up right now, pound your chest. We all feel like. Oh, we're not hearing all of that now. <laughs> <laughs> but we all feel like, you know, we got to be Superman, you know, and especially if you're a, a good guy, you're trying to, you know, take care of your family. You're trying to provide for your wife, your kids. You know, we all want to be that provider. And that was my mindset. So that mindset coupled with I'm always a problem solver, you know, I think I was just looking for ways to begin to work out of it. Yeah. So when I found that and shared it with you, we just started listening, and that kind of started our journey somewhat. Yeah, that's good. You are definitely a problem solver. Um, Chris tries to solve all of the problems, even when people don't want them solved. <laughs> all we want is to be heard or listened to. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> look, 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 look. I- I've gotten better. You know, I say, okay, am I just listening now? Or- that's right. Or am I solving problems? Ask the am question, I, honey. Ask the question. Am I giving you feedback? That's or right. Or am I just hearing what you're saying? That's so, right. That's you right. You know, all the fellows out there, just know sometimes you got to pause and not solve the problem, but maybe just ask a question. Thanks, hon. So, that's that's good. That's really good. That's one of those bonus things that you'll get from the <laughs> podcast. You know, we, we'll talk about a lot, but, you know, sometimes we have little pearls we just, we just want to drop out there for you all. <laughs> but you know what's funny is in that moment, the best version of you was the person who was trying to be the problem solver because leave it up to me. We probably wouldn't be on this journey where we are in that beginning time. And so once I decided, yeah, I think I'll listen to him. You know, I think I was the reluctant convert to Dave Ramsey and no, we didn't necessarily agree with everything that he said. And I think that that's also a point of wisdom too, is that, you can learn from a lot of people. You learn a little nugget here, a little nugget there. You read a book, you go to a conference, and you get what you can from the information. Always be a person who can absorb something, and then if something doesn't apply to you, it's okay, move on. But I think that um, I was able to say, let me, I was open. Let's put it that way. I was open to listen, and we went to one of Dave Ramsey's live events in Phoenix, you know, just shortly after he found him on the radio. And then that January, like right after that event, we enlisted all of our friends. We were like, let's get all our friends to do Financial Peace University together. Everything is better with friends. I think I think we voluntold them. <laughs> we did. I think we voluntold. We didn't volunteer. We didn't say volunteer. We No, no, no. We were like, hey, you're going to do this with us. We were out there like strong arming people. Like, yes. Hey, you're going to do this with us. We're not going to be we're not going to be the only ones out here. That's right. And we wanted to make sure that our friends were debt free, too. So we wanted to learn together as a team. And and I believe we had about 10 or 12 couples that actually did this in a small group format in those that early year. And I mean, I think that obviously things are more fun with friends, but it was also accountability with people who you saw on a regular basis. And that 
is a strong way to make sure that you stay the course or you you know that somebody might be asking you about, you know, things and it's more comfortable when it's a friend or you have this commonality together. And so I think that that was great. It took us it took us about 5 years to get out of our debt when we finally decided to do it, but over the course of that time there was a lot that we experienced. We it, we had two children. Chris experienced some job loss. We went backwards and got another car payment. Like we had a car breakdown. We had tons going. Life happened and crap hit the fan. And we still were able to eventually get out of it. It took us about five years to get out of over $90,000 in debt. And so that just making sure that we stuck to it and we were consistent and we didn't allow the pitfalls or the times if we fell down to keep us from our goal, we stuck with it. And honestly, there are no regrets. I mean, we could have gotten out quicker had we made other decisions, but we enjoyed the journey too. I mean, we have vacations we pay cash for and we made sure that um, we enjoyed along the way too. I think you say something that's important and that is we could have gotten out sooner. We could have done some things differently. So if you're going through a similar situation, don't beat yourself up, you know, because one thing that I recall distinctly is when we were early on in that period, like we didn't grow up with a lot of, you know, financial knowledge or, you know, just all the ancillary things when you talk about finances. So Erica and I actually started to seek people out, seek professionals out to learn more. So not only were we like focusing on getting rid of debt, but we started, you know, we engaged a CPA. And so we could start thinking about taxes and understanding the relationship with taxes. And we started seeking out insurance professionals and we started going to seminars. And so we really took took the the time to begin to develop our financial IQ. So we wouldn't have to re- rely and trust on someone else's perspective, but we began to develop our own perspective. And that's the thing about it is that while there are a lot of people out there that have systems and processes, you have to figure out what works for you. You may take a part from here, a part from there, a piece from this, a piece from that. And when you put it all together, you have created something that is customized that works for you and your situation. So no matter where you're at, no matter, no matter where you're starting, just get started. Because yeah. I think that was the important thing is that we were young and we started young. And now here it is these years later. We have so many stories to tell and share with you guys that you'll hear in future episodes. But we have experience to stand on. Yeah. And I remember uh, one of our pastors, he said, you can only live off the experience of another man before you have to go and get your own experience. Mm-hmm. And so we went out and we got our own experience. So we understood. And when you can explain something to someone else, then you know that you've got it. Mm -hmm. And that became my bar is to be able to turn around and explain concepts to other people because then I knew I had it. Then I knew that I was going in the right direction. And so that five-year journey, it really wasn't that long in the grand scheme of things. And here we are these years later in a totally different situation. And that's why I hope that, you know, as you guys listen to this, you'll hear, you'll know that whatever situation you're in, we've been there. We've walked in those shoes. And so as we give you insights, take some of the pieces from here and apply them to your situation and do what it is that you need to do to get motivated today to change your situation. Yeah. You know, what I'll add to that too is that consistency is key. I think a lot of people think that when they mess up, oh, that's it. Let me throw caution to the wind. (laughs) And it's really easy to fall into the trap of thinking that just because you messed up, that maybe you don't have it, the it factor to actually finish strong or to get out of debt or to save a bunch of money or whatever it is that you want to do. And the, the truth of the matter is that nobody is perfect, right? No journey is perfect. Life isn't perfect. So get back up and get on it again and show yourself that you can be relied upon to 
be consistent and and trustworthy with the goals that you have set, with the vision that you have in front of you. And I think that is one of the things that is helpful when you actually share your goal or what it is that you're trying to do with someone else. The power in that is accountability. And and in a couple relationship, it makes it easier because you've already got that person who you're trying to go on the same journey together. But if you're single, find somebody that you can, you know, connect with who is not going to be the shopping buddy or the person who's going to help you spend money, but someone who might be aspirational for you, who can help, you know, guide you and make sure that you you stay on target as well. So I just think that consistency is key. It is the name of the game when it comes to the long term getting out of debt and making sure that you actually have purpose with your dollars because um, not every day is going to be an up day and you have to make sure that you have that mindset to stay the course. So And, and don't knock progress. Oh, absolutely. Because while our journey, we move forward, we move back. We went from, you know, buying a car on, you know, uh, five year terms to buying a car and paying it off in, you know, two and a half years to buying a car, putting significant amount of money down and paying it off in a year to, you know, buying cars and paying cash for cars now. And that's a progress. That's a process. It doesn't all happen overnight. And so if you're one where you're out there and you have to pay a car off, okay, you know, think about what you're going to do for the next one. Maybe you'll put half the money down and pay it off in, you know, a year. And then you keep progressing. And then next time you need a car, you'll maybe you save and you'll pay, you know, cash for the car. But I say don't knock progress. Yep. And the journey doesn't have to be perfect. And that's where when Erica talks about consistency and when you speak, when you bring that up, that's an important thing. Remain committed to the process mm -hmm. because we talked about it in one of the previous episodes where, you know, it's that bigger. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to say no to things and you really have to prioritize what you want. And we talk about today, but we think about what the future looks like. Yeah. And I know you have, you know, some, you know, you have your, your system <laughs> that, that, you know, talk about. Yeah. I mean, I think that a lot of people fail to realize that, when we're looking at getting out of debt, managing money, saving for the future, anything where it concerns your financial life, that is more than just the numbers. It's, there's a lot that goes into that. And I think a lot of times people don't consider the idea that your money passed or how you handled it or what you, how you learned about money or didn't learn about money is affecting the way that you're behaving today or not looking at your credit report is affecting your ability to get out of debt or not dreaming about the future is affecting your ability to see something brighter or have that hope that I talked about in the very beginning. And so that's why, you know, I look at your money past, your money present and your money future, because it's giving you a much fuller perspective on the financial picture. But here's, I looked up something that I thought was interesting um, that just ties into getting out of debt and the notion and idea that you can do it. A survey on creditcards.com said that more than two in five Americans currently carrying debt don't know when they'll pay off those balances. Wow. I mean, that's crazy. And then one in four say they expect that their debts will outlive them. And that scares Everything in me like it. And it's very frustrating, actually, too, that our society has allowed people to think that they will die with debt. And that is a really sad thing to think about. We have an aunt right now who's 100 years old. And my goodness, if that woman had any debt right now, I mean, think about how much of a strain it would be to feel like 80 years of your life. You were in debt. That is disgusting, frustrating, annoying, overwhelming. I can't even, there's too many feelings and emotions that would come up to think that a full life you would have debt can't, following you around payments, interest. That's insane. And look, she's out there living her best life. So Absolutely. She has no worries. That's she's right. That's right. And so I just can't, I, you know, that's not a world that I want to live in. That's not something that I'm willing to accept. That is 
the mission that I have is to let people know that it's possible for you to live without the strap of payments and debt. And so you just got to put one foot in front of the other, take one step and be consistent with that. So we always pose this to you guys. Is it worth it? You know, <laughs> is that worth it? No. Absolutely not. You know, you have to be willing to, you know, def- the delay gratification or or wait. And we've adopted, you know, this mentality, 100% down, zero a month. Yeah. That's how we're going to roll. If we can't pay cash for it, then we're just going to wait until mm-hmm. we can. Or we're going to say no, or we're going to look at other options and do things differently. And so is it worth it? No, it's not worth it to get in debt because of the stress and the strain and all the things it does to you physically and mentally and the stresses it puts on your relationships. It's not worth it because there's so much more that's out there. And I would add, I'll flip it around. Is it worth it to take the time and be consistent to get free? Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. Shout That's out right. to my fire movement people out there. <laughs> you know, you know who you are. That's if right. You know, you know. That's right. And I would even say if there were one thing for you to do is add up your monthly payments right now on the things that you have in debt, your credit card, student loans, car payments, you know, pay as you go, whatever it is, add up those payments and face the number that you're spending every single month. And then dream about what's possible with that same amount of money if you were to pay that debt off, if you were to commit and be consistent. Look, I'm going to give you my one little my one little ask, or I say this is something that I still do to this day. I always take cash out of the bank. Mm-hmm. I'm probably one of the few people... <laughs> Walking around with cash he is in my pocket. Old school, okay. But what's funny is I've been bragging to Erica how new school I am because I've got, you know, <laughs> got technology on my phone. I've got my Apple wallet set up. And, but I keep cash on me. And I will be honest with you. I move differently because I'm like, uh, do I need this? Do I want to do into my cash? And when you spend cash, it just registers differently. So it makes me sometimes say, you know, no, nah, I don't need that. I'm a I'm going to hold on to my money because, I don't know, maybe it's a psychological thing for me growing up, not having money, but I always want to have money in my pocket. That's why I always carry a $2 bill because your boy is never down to his last dollar. (laughs) And I think that's a good principle. I honestly, I know it's challenging for a lot of people to wrap their minds around using cash for things, but I just say try it for 30 days. Date the idea. Just take it out for a specific category. Um, and see how you feel. Maybe you'll make different decisions and even just journal a little bit about how it was to either spend it or not spend it. And we're not talking large sums of money, um, but even if you just took $100 out of your account and made decisions when you were out and about places and just really were thoughtful about some of that, I think that would be a really great exercise. All right, so there you have it. That's our debt story. That's how we did it. You know, if you want to know more, hear more about it, you know, reach out to us. You can reach us on social. And, you know, you guys can check our landing page out for betterandworth.com. Uh, and so just check us out, and we'll be getting back with you. And so we look forward to uh, reaching back out in our ne- next episode. So I'm Chris. And I'm Erica. And this was your For Better and Worth podcast. Thank you for spending some of your time with us today. We appreciate all your support, so be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen to this podcast. You can find us on Instagram at For Better and Worth. And sign up for our email on ForBetterAndWorth.com. Till next time, we're out of here.